The out of Africa theory. Because of the fact that humans were hunter-gatherers, remember I said we were nomadic, we moved around, we followed our food sources. Well, as animal species migrated out of Africa following the last ice age, that was approximately 100,000 BC, people had to follow those animal herds, and eventually they followed those animal herds to other parts of the world, like the Middle East, Europe, East Asia, and even eventually as far away as places like North and South America. Now, humans followed their food sources, and that was the main cause for people to leave Africa. And eventually, they spread human culture and human civilization all over the world, because when farming came around, that changed everything. Okay, now the next thing it asks about is the Neolithic Revolution, and that goes right along with farming. So, the Neolithic Revolution was that time period between 8,000 BC in about 1,500 BC. That was the time period when humans changed their method of food production. It was a big shift from gathering food to producing food. That's really what you ought to know about the Neolithic Revolution. The Neolithic Revolution eventually led to what we call a food surplus. Surplus means having more of something than you actually need. And this was something that allowed people to begin to specialize in other kinds of jobs. Because since we had a food surplus, not everybody was needed to produce food anymore. So now people could have other jobs like being an artisan or a merchant or a, a priest or a scribe. All those new jobs opened up during the Neolithic Revolution. All right, let me move on here in my notes. Let's see what else we got. Um, Something else that you ought to know about the Neolithic Revolution is that there was a huge growth in population worldwide. Remember we said there was more food. And something that we see all throughout history is anytime there's more food, we end up having more people. So population growth is a big part of the Neolithic Revolution. You may also remember that people developed new tools and new technologies to make their lives easier. And humans also began to domesticate animals during this time period. In case you forgot what domesticate means, that means controlling the growth and reproduction of animals and having them serve human needs. Like for example, having dogs as pets or to help you hunt, or having cows and pigs and goats and sheep as a food source. That's domestication. Now, most of these changes that happened during the Neolithic Revolution were very good for people. But there were some things that were kind of negative, uh, things that actually had a bad effect on the planet. Like, for example, early farmers were not very environmentally friendly in the way they did things. Many of them practiced something called slash and burn agriculture, where you basically cut down all the trees in an area and burn them, which enriches the soil for a while, but then eventually the soil loses most of its nutrients and you can't farm there anymore. This led to massive deforestation and actually a lot of the world's forests were lost forever because people weren't very careful about how they were farming in those early days. Now, uh, eventually, farming which began in the Fertile Crescent began to spread all over the world and before long, all of the people of the world were practicing farming as a way to have settled civilizations. Okay, so next up, agriculture. What is agriculture and what does it look like? Well. Agriculture is just a fancy way of saying farming. Hopefully you remember that. Agriculture equals farming. Now, some words that go along with agriculture are like domestication. You know, sometimes we say that when we adapted plants for human use that we domesticated the plants. Uh, we also domesticated animals at this time. Horticulture is another word that you ought to know. Horticulture is just a fancy way of saying people gardening or growing their own food. And another word that goes along with that is cultivation. Cultivation is yet another word meaning when people grow food, okay? Now, at first, all this farming and cultivation appeared to uh, guarantee a much larger food supply. But eventually, people realized that there were some problems. Like, for example, when you have a large population, it can lead to things like crime and war. 
Uh, having domesticated animals can lead to diseases, and depending too much on crops can sometimes lead to famine if your crops fail. Also, remember I said that some of their farming practices were not very good for the environment, and so there was a whole lot of environmental damage that happened at this time. All right, so next up is domestication. What is domestication? Well, we've talked about it a little bit. Domestication means adapting animals, or sometimes plants, to serve human needs. So for example, um, dogs. A long, long time ago, there were no dogs. All there were was wolves. Humans learned that wolves could be used to help us hunt. So over time, humans selected the wolves that were more friendly to humans, allowed them to breed and reproduce, and eventually, what used to be a wolf became a dog. Now this takes hundreds of years, it's not something that happens overnight, but humans were smart enough to figure out that domesticating animals and plants could make their lives easier. Now, uh, let's talk about the importance of rivers. It's pretty obvious that rivers were important because pretty much all of these ancient civilizations that we've studied built their civilizations along a river. And if you took world geography, you should remember why most cities are built near rivers. Rivers are really good for providing rich soil. You got to have good soil if you want to farm. Rivers are also used to irrigate crops so they can bring water to your plants. They could provide more food and more drinking water. And they're also good for transportation. Most people use rivers as a sort of a natural highway, kind of like they did in ancient Egypt. Uh, the Nile River was kind of like their version of I-45. It was how most people got from point A to point B. Scar. Hopefully everybody remembers what scar means. Uh, if you don't remember, there's another video right here on my YouTube that you could watch which talks all about scar. But real quick, I'm going to run through what each letter stands for. Okay, so the S in SCAR stands for specialization of labor. Remember that specialization was something that happened as a result of the food surplus caused by the Neolithic Revolution. There was so much food that not everybody was needed to produce food anymore. So people were free to pursue other kinds of jobs besides just being a farmer or a hunter or gatherer. So that's when we started having the first laborers, artisans and merchants and scribes all those specialized jobs that we've been talking about. The C in SCAR stands for complex institutions. Remember that a complex institution is some kind of an organization that lasts for a long time and gives structure and meaning to a society. Great examples of complex institutions could be like governments and religions. And uh, one important development that happened in religion and government at this time was the first written law code. Now, you may remember me talking about this in class, but the first written law code came from Mesopotamia. It was written down by a king called Hammurabi, and the whole idea was to write down the laws so that they could last for a long time. Hey, that sounds like a complex institution to me. So, next up is the A's in SCAR. Remember, there's two A's in SCAR. The first A stands for advanced cities. Uh, as people began to settle down, their towns and villages became bigger and more complex. Eventually, these towns and villages had walls around them. They started having big permanent buildings like ziggurats and pyramids. And over time, they became major centers of trade and interaction and exchange of culture. A great example of an advanced city could be like Mohenjo-Daro, which was located in the Indus Valley Civilization. You might remember from the SCAR video lesson, they actually had sewers and indoor toilets, they had public trash bins, and even planned out street grid patterns to make navigation around the city easier. The second A is advanced technology. You know, some of the things that they called advanced in the ancient world don't seem very advanced to us today, but when you really consider the fact that people had to figure out how to make these things all on their own without anybody showing them what to do, it really gives you an appreciation for how advanced these people really were. Now, you may remember from the SCAR video that the perfect example of advanced technology that I used came from the Shang Dynasty in China. You may remember that they were masters of crafting bronze. Bronze is a type of metal that's made from mixing copper and tin. Not an easy thing to do. Also, if you think about other types of technology, maybe not quite as sophisticated as bronze, but still impressive, were like the terraces that were used by the Chauvin in South America. 
Now, if you don't remember what a terrace is, it's that sort of staircase looking carving that they do on the side of the mountain so that they can have flat areas for farming and also it can shore up the side of the mountain and prevent erosion during rain. Pretty smart. Uh, other types of advanced technology could come from mathematic understanding uh, and there's evidence of that in the pyramids and the ziggurats. So all over the ancient world there were many examples of advanced technology. And last of all, R is for record keeping. Most advanced civilizations had some method of writing. That's what record keeping means. So for example, you may remember that in Mesopotamia they used a type of writing called cuneiform where they pushed those little wedge-shaped uh, symbols into soft clay tablets so that they could last for a long time. Other examples could be like the oracle bones and Chinese writing that was developed in the Shang Dynasty and of course hieroglyphics that were used by the Egyptians. Okay, so that's SCAR. Okay, next up, location of river valley civilizations. Well, there's no really great way for me to just tell you this, so why don't you check out this map. So the first one it lists is Mesopotamia, okay? Now, Mesopotamia is that part of the Fertile Crescent that we today call Iraq. Mesopotamia means the land between two rivers, and the rivers that we're talking about are the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Now, one of the most important things that Mesopotamia gave us was the first written law code. Remember I said the first written law code was Hammurabi's code, okay? Now, uh, they also built ziggurats, which you may remember were those really big temples. Uh, they looked almost kind of like pyramids in ancient Egypt. And um, they even traded with other civilizations like the Indus Valley Civilization. Okay, sorry, I got stuck for a minute there. Okay, uh, next up is Egypt. Uh, I think you probably know a little bit about ancient Egypt. They were also part of the Fertile Crescent, but they were in a different area. They were sort of in the southwestern part of the Fertile Crescent in North Africa near the Nile River. Remember, the Nile River is where they were located. Um, one thing about the Egyptians was that they had a written language, like hieroglyphics. Hopefully everybody remembers those picture symbols, hieroglyphics. And they also had god kings called pharaohs. Remember that the pharaoh was not only the leader of the government, but he was also the leader of religion which means that Egypt had a theocracy, a government that is run by religious leaders. They also built pyramids, so they had to have pretty advanced mathematical technology, and uh, the people of Egypt depended very heavily on the Nile River, not only for farming, but also for transportation. Okay, next up is the Indus Valley Civilization. Uh, the Indus Valley Civilization was actually pretty lucky that they had some geographic advantages in their favor. Like, for example, the Himalaya Mountains protected them from invasion from the north. Uh, they also had the Indian Ocean to the south, which sort of isolated them from other cultures, but made it easy for them to go out on boats and go trade if they wanted to, okay? Which they did. Uh, they also had monsoons, which are powerful seasonal rains that made their land very fertile. And last of all, you might remember that the Indus Valley uh, merchants had special seals, which were kind of, like, um, kind of like an ancient version of a receipt. And so that was a proof of purchase that you bought something from an Indus Valley merchant. Oh, and before I forget, of course, they also had indoor plumbing. <laughs> no small thing, that's right. Indoor plumbing, indoor toilets in the Indus Valley. Okay, next up is the Shang Dynasty. I know it looks like Shang, but Shang, they were the ones that were in China. Uh, you may remember that they were masters at creating bronze. They were also the first ones to develop China's written language. So that was a really special thing about the Shang Dynasty. They practiced ancestor worship, and their traditions were able to stay intact for so long. As a matter of fact, some of them are still around today because of the fact that China was isolated by geographic barriers like, for example, the Himalaya Mountains and the Talkil Makan Desert. Those uh, barriers were very difficult for people to traverse, and that's why for a long time, few people knew about China, uh, and it didn't really become a place that people knew about until the 19th century. So, kind of an interesting place there, the Shang. And last of all, uh, 
It asks about the Olmec on your test review, but I can tell you that there's really nothing about the Olmec on your test, so you're not going to need to know much about them. Uh, they were that ancient civilization that lived in Mexico. However, there will be some questions about the Chavin, so you do need to know a bit about them. The Chavin lived in South America in the Andes Mountains, which is not a very easy environment to live in. For one thing, uh, if you live in the mountains, it's hard to farm. So remember I said that the Chavin had to build terraces to do terrace farming. That was a form of advanced technology that they possessed. Okay, next up is theocracy. You may remember that theocracy is a type of government system where religious leaders are in charge. So that makes ancient Egypt a great example of a theocracy from the development of early river valley civilizations because ancient Egypt was ruled by a pharaoh. Pharaohs were supposed to be living gods or god kings. That meant they were in charge of the religion and in charge of the government. Hence, a theocracy. Next up, Hammurabi's Code. What was it? Well, it was the unifying law code of ancient Mesopotamia. And the reason why it was important was because it was one of the first law codes in history that was written down. Remember, that's part of SCAR. It's that record-keeping part. And also because of the fact that it was something that treated people differently based on their social classes. So that's actually kind of an old type of law.